Last week, we talked just for a few moments about uh, where we're headed in terms of our forward effort. We return today to some very important principles, and I hope you found your way to Hebrews chapter number 10. Is your faith real? That's really the question. Is your faith real? We've been looking at a number of different well-known common passages in the Bible to help us go back and try to somewhat reevaluate our faith. What, what is our faith based in and that connectivity? We talked about the importance of the vine and we've looked at some different dimensions of our faith. But today uh, I come to you and really with just one point, although there's a number of things I'm going to have you write down. In fact, if the truth be known, we don't believe, our, our staff doesn't believe in taking any weeks off. Holidays, we don't pull a folder out and say, we'll just do this service again like we did a couple years ago. Hey, uh, every single Lord's Day, we communicate, we lead worship, all for one common purpose, and that is to see a heart change and a change in people's lives. And so today I come to you really just with one central focus I mean, if you just had to nail down the one thing that I want to communicate to you today, and I just hope that you can allow this principle to go from your head to your heart. I, I hope some way that the Spirit of God will birth in you something new that will lead you to take either the next step in your faith or really the first step in your faith. You might just want to jot this down. Here's the one central theme that we're really going to focus on today, and that is God specializes in using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Let me say that again. God specializes, I mean, he actually loves taking ordinary people and doing some in extraordinary things to their lives. Our Bible's filled with this. It doesn't matter if it's a fisherman or an uneducated person or a prostitute or a stutterer or a rough-talking individual, foul mouth, somebody that's poor, someone that's wealthy. Our Bibles are literally filled. I mean, the pages are littered with one person after another, just common, ordinary people that God said, hey, I'm going to use them. I'm going to do something special with their life. Now, that should spur a question in each one of us. And I ask you that question this morning. Why is it that God uses certain people to really incredible heights and then seemingly does very little through other people? Again, the question posed to you is this. Why does God use certain people and not others? And today, I hope that we can speak to that. Now, you've got to understand that when you and I, and every one of us have these, bring our limitations into the equation. There's no perfect individual here today. There, we, we all have certain limitations. When we bring those into a picture in our relationship with God, it's not as if we're bringing some kind of prohibition where God can't use us. In fact, just the opposite is true. Do you understand that when you and I bring our limitations to God, he often uses those kind of like what I'm standing on today, platforms to demonstrate and display his amazing grace. He does things with even through those limitations that no one else can even imagine. So today, as we begin reading in just a moment in Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to be aware of what we're going to be reading about is God's primary agenda for every single one of you today. Did you get that? Every person in this room, we're going to be reading about God's primary agenda for your life. You do understand, don't you, that as we read, every one of us is going to have the availability of what we're going to be reading about. It's going to be available to every one of you today. It's not going to say, well, you on this side can't have what we're studying, what we're reading about, what we're learning today. Now, you over here, you can have it. Oh, no, no. It's available to everyone. And what we're going to be reading about today literally separates the religious. And I can't, can I be completely transparent today? Of course I can. I'm the pastor. That's one reason I really didn't want to come back to East Texas. One thing that was so refreshing about being out of the Bible Belt 
was, man, people were just groping in darkness in New Mexico. But man, they didn't try to pretend to be anything they weren't. I mean, on Sunday, if they didn't know the Lord, they were at the casino, man, doing what lost people do, gambling all their money away. Or they were on the ski slope. Or they were out boozing it up. But one of the big challenges that we have, and I can say that because I'm one of us, is we have so much pretense that stems across the South and what we call the Bible Belt. And what I'm speaking to you about today is significant especially in light that you and I, uh, what we're reading about today separates people from the religious in terms of the other group being those that really mold and shape and transform the lives of the people around them. And this is a very important day for us as we think about really is our faith real? What do we really have this faith thing that we say we have, this Christianity, this relationship with God. And you got to understand the thing we're about to read about is always rewarded by God. It is always being asked of us every single day of our lives. And you already know what we're going to be talking about today. And that is this element of faith. Now, when I say faith, I'm not talking about just having a set of doctrine some fundamental principles of God's word. Many of us think we have faith when we come to know Christ. Hey, we're people of faith. And in that sense, we are. We have a covenant of faith in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But faith, according to the scripture, is so much more. Faith is taking that set of foundational principles, the belief part, and acting upon it. Did you get that? Say to your, ta- you to, I mean, to your neighbor, look to someone near you right now and say, faith is acting on our belief. Say that right now to somebody. Say it. Don't just look at me. Good job. Faith is acting upon the very beliefs. There's nowhere greater than chapters 10, 11, and 12 in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read quickly today because we're going to be reading a pretty broad block of Scripture. I hope you'll follow along with me. We're going to begin reading in verse number 32, Hebrews chapter 10. And I hope that these are very familiar passages. I hope for our students, they say, hey, yeah, hey, I've heard that before. I hope for some of our young married couples, hey, (laughs) we've, we've heard that before. Those are good things. Here's what God's Word says in Hebrews 10 beginning in verse 32. Remember? Remember those earlier days? And again, the writer of Hebrews is going to be talking very personal to to those early first century Christians that have been through some hard days. He said, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes, he says, you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution At other times, he says, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered, verse 34, along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but by my righteous, one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who, look at this phrase, shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Now turn with me very quickly, Hebrews 11, 10, 11, and 12. We're going to look at all three chapters, just pieces of them. And let's look at these first five or six verses. Hebrews 11, I'll begin reading in verse number one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous 
And when God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By by faith, verse 5, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And notice verse 6, maybe arguably, maybe the greatest verse in all the Bible on faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, very quickly, let's look at three verses in chapter 12. Then we move on with the application of what I want you to see from these verses today. Hebrews 12, begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, therefore, since we were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, if you will, the trailblazer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Every single one of us is called to have faith, the belief in God but faith being defined with a whole separate dimension. Faith and the ability to act on it. Certain action. And today I hope you brought something to write with because I'm just going to toss out to you seven very important elements of how to grow your faith. I wish someone in student ministry, I mean, I learned a lot of great things in student ministry at Oakland Heights Baptist Church, but unfortunately, I don't ever remember anyone sitting down and saying, look, my uncle Cook, you've been a believer five years now. Now you're in middle school. You're in high school. Man, you ought to be taking the next steps in your faith. Let me communicate from God's word how you get there. I guess it was just kind of assumed by the process, the Sunday school thing, the church thing, the youth gatherings, the camp experience once a year, kind of hanging around with other Christians, that I guess some of that was going to kind of rub off on me, and I was just going to learn naturally, it was just going to evolve naturally, that all of a sudden, my faith was going to go beyond just a belief in who God was, and an understanding of who I was, and certainly who I was not into something much greater. And what I'm communicating to you today is that does not happen. For you to get to the place where you're one of those that God chooses to use you in a remarkable way, just an ordinary person to do extraordinary things, why does God select some and not others? And I would suggest to you that almost always it's one thing that separates those groups. And that separation almost always comes through the level of faith that we demonstrate in our lives. So seven quick, rapid-fire items that I hope you'll write down and take with you on how you can grow your faith. How do you get faith? How do you grow it? Number one, jot this down, it all starts with the Bible. Now understand what I'm sharing with you. Out of Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we, we pretty much got this earmark, this verse in our soul, in our Bibles. Faith comes by hearing and what? Hearing what? The, the message, the message is heard. And, and it has to be heard. It has to be a heard word, heard word, an understood word about Christ through the act of hearing through God's word. In other words, what I'm communicating to you is if, if, if your faith is ever going to grow, you're, most of you are going to have to change how you handle this. Nine times out of ten, 
If we come to church two times a month or three times a month, we're digging around on those times that we come for the same Bible that we laid there in the car seat, in the glove box, underneath the seat, hopefully not on the dashboard because we know what the sun does to the Bible. It, it will look like that after one day on your dashboard. Hopefully you don't do that. But uh, you only have to learn that one time though, don't you? Amen? No one was brave enough to say amen to that. And most of you have fried at least one Bible on your dashboard. First black, black mark against you today, not being honest in church, you're better than that. You're better than that. Hey, God's word's got to be a part of our lives. It's got to be more than the 34 minutes that you catch in the service. That's not going to sustain you through cancer. That's not going to sustain you through marital problems. It's not going to sustain you through temptations or sexual activity. Man, you've got to have more than that. And what I'm communicating to you is faith and the growth of it in our lives always starts in our mind and our heart when we wrap it around the incredible principles of God's word. And I'm talking about soaking in it, thinking about it, memorizing it, being filled with it, and understanding the truth of God to the point that you and I are able to see through a biblical lens. We start seeing things through biblical lenses. All of a sudden, a 16-year-old girl, after she's marinated in God's Word for several years, begins to see that she is valuable. She's not a piece of meat. She's more than locker room talk. And so for her, knowing how important she is to the Lord Jesus Christ and how he bought her and paid for her and redeemed her so she can be free of all that baggage in her life, she begins to see certain things to say, you know what, group dating makes a lot more sense to me than one-on-one car dating. She starts seeing that differently. It doesn't, it's, it's not a war with her parents. It's not a war, can she date, and what age? All of a sudden, she starts to inhabit certain principles from God's word because she's so soaked in those, it's a lot more than grabbing it and having a little 30-minute dose on a Wednesday night or a 30-minute dose on Sunday morning. All of a sudden, it begins to be a real part of their life. A few years ago, God had given us, for whatever reason, he's trusted us with a lot of people in our church that had Parkinson's disease. In fact, to the point, I wondered, hey, is there a certain chemical in the water here in Longview? Man, we just had all these people with Parkinson's. Now, as I look around five years later, man, God has inundated our church family with people that have parents with Alzheimer's dementia type of issues. A lady in our church asked me several weeks ago, would you go by and see my dad? He's not a member of Oakland Heights. He is a believer. And uh, pastor, if you just have time, I know how busy you are. Would you just go by? And I said, sure, I will. So uh, I think it was like two weeks ago, I was able to go by. And of course, for you that have never been in a memory care unit, that thing's locked up and secured because it's not so much people getting into them, but it's them getting out and them getting lost or harmed in some way. So there's all kinds of security, not just COVID security, but just locks and combinations. Finally, I got back there to see him and had about a 15, maybe 20 minute visit with him, had a great visit. Four times throughout the visit, he asked me, now who are you? And each time I responded the same way by saying, I think I'm the most handsome guy you've ever seen, aren't I? I said, no, I'm Michael Cook from Oakland Heights Baptist Church. Your daughter asked me to come by. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so we would talk a while, and he said, now, who are you? I said, well, I'm still the same guy. I'm Michael Cook from Oakland Heights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, I'm glad you came by, Pastor. And so when I got ready to leave, I got to be a little honest. I mean, I had a great time of prayer with him. And knowing that when I walked off and we concluded the prayer, he would not remember the prayer three minutes from then because short-term memory was completely gone. And so as as I got just to the door, and I I, I think I took maybe one or two steps, I heard from his room, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And when I heard those words, I stopped in my tracks, spun around, walked back in the room, and then he and I began to say the rest of the 23rd Psalm together. And you know what's so amazing to me? I bet he did not miss 
two words, King James Version, all the way through the 23rd Psalm. And here's a guy that for 15 minutes could not remember four different times the name of the pastor standing in front of him. But you see, throughout his lifetime, he invested in the Word of God. He spent time there. He soaked. He marinated his mind in that. He memorized God's Word to the point that even in those moments, some of the last, no doubt, days of his life, when everything else, the world had, world had stripped everything else from him, his dignity, can't bathe himself, can't take care of himself, doesn't even remember the most important people in his life any longer, despite all of that being gone. The one thing that God had allowed him to hide in his heart was the word of God. And I'm telling you, if you're ever going to grow your faith, it's always, the Bible says, it's going to start right here. Jot down this second thing. How do I grow my faith, pastor? You, it starts with the Bible. And number two, you give God the first and the best from your life. You always have got to come to that place where you grow into, did you hear that? You grow into giving God your first and your best. When you come to chapter 11, I know maybe you didn't catch this, maybe it did resonate with you, but it resonated with me. Because in the Hebrew language, there's, uh, I mean, uh, there's two very important things in the Hebrew and Greek in first century Understand, the Hebrew part of our Bible, the Old Testament, goes back hundreds of years. But later, just before we get to intertestamental period of time, the Bible kind of goes dark in between your Old and New Testament. We don't have any writing there. We think there's about a 300-year period in between those testaments. But by the time you get to first century writing, what we call New Testament, it's interesting because now the whole Greek and the language is changing. What we have in our text is Koine or street Greek or slang Greek. And, 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 and as you begin to read it and try to process through it, I, th I think it's significant that we understand that where things are positioned to carry a lot of authority. For instance, if there's 10 men mentioned in a list, and your name is listed first in the Greek language, as in the Hebrew, really, hey, whoever's listed first carries the most prominence. And isn't it interesting when we get to that roll call, the Hall of Fame guys and gals in Hebrews 11, and there's many of them mentioned. We just read the first few verses. Did you notice who the first example of faith who God listed first? It was a man named Abel. And did you notice in, in chapter 11 what Abel was recognized for in terms of his faith, his action? Abel made such a radical choice in his life. Abel came to that place in his faith dimension that he said, you know what, just as the first, verse 3 in, 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 in chapter 11 tells us, he began to recognize, hey, our God created all this. He spoke creation into existence. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him an offering. And it's not going to be just any offering. It's going to be my first offering. As soon as the world gives me something, I'm going to give a portion of that back. And it's going to be the first and it's going to be the best. Now notice his brother, who is not mentioned here, well, mentioned it only in a sense that, hey, that offering was not as good. His brother Cain gave an offering as well, but it was not the sacrifice that Abel did. Abel gave a blood offering. When you give a live animal offering, that's not coming back to you next year. His brother was more the farmer. So he took a part of his crops, but those crops will come back. They'll make again. But Abel, oh no, no, no. Abel gave a blood offering. He gave of the very best that he had. And so God says something very interesting here to us. Hey, if you really want your faith to grow, it all starts with a recognition of who God is and that's all his to begin with. You see, the word begins to deal with us. 
You think, well, the pastor said something about the offering today. And to be truthful, I fit in that category with about 60% of all people in evangelical life that don't give a single penny to the Lord's work. Another 20 that give a token amount. And about 18% of everybody in evangelical life carry over 85% of the operating budget. Do you understand? Randy Cathy stood here a moment ago. What he didn't tell you is that about 18%, a little less than 2 out of 10 of every person on the hoof at Oakland Heights Baptist Church, we carry 85% of the entire operating budget at this church. And so most of you today, you fit in to that category that you give nothing or you give very little, usually out of what's left over. And that's okay if that's what God's leading you to do. But your faith will not go very far until you're willing to surrender to the fact that, you know what, <laughs> Everything's God's in a way. They're going to put me in a box or I'm going to be like one of those Russian soldiers. I'm going to die on the battlefield somewhere. They're going to cremate me right there in the field. They're not going to take my remains back to Russia. Too much drama when the body goes back. No, they're just going to, they're going to burn me up right there in the field. And you know, you're not going to be able to take anything you've got with you. Not a single solitary thing. God created you. Out of the very dust, it says he created us, and back to the dust we'll go. But you know, a, a pastor's not going to be able to get you there. I can't get you there. The word of God's got to get you there. All of a sudden, just like that young lady that says, you know, I'm not a piece of meat. All of a sudden, a young man in his home, new, new married couple, he steps up and says, you know what? God is doing something in my life. And you know what? I need to give God the first and the best. And when you start to make those kind of sacrifices because you want to, and because the word of God, there's something that's convicting inside of you, and it's a lot more than a fat, bald-headed preacher that's been here five years. It's a lot bigger than that. How do you grow your faith? You grow your faith by the word of God. You grow your faith by giving God your first and best. Number three, you grow your faith by understanding this principle. Faith is caught, it's not taught. Faith is caught, it is not taught. When you start looking at this roll call of great men and women in Hebrews 11, understand that their faith seems to be generated, I mean, Rahab, a prostitute, Abraham, Moses, hey, Abel, Enoch. I mean, it, it doesn't matter which name you pull up. All of them had some kind of incredible life-changing elements that happened in their life. And they became very obedient. They became extremely faithful to the cause of the Lord. And there's no record of, of any of those. I mean, you take Moses, golly, I... I mean, I think we could write a book about old Moses. I mean, there's been enough books written, but maybe there's room for one more. I mean, here's a guy that was abandoned. Boy, what a message for today's culture to those individuals who say, well, I'm adopted. Well, hey, my parents gave me up, man. They didn't even want me. <laughs> I mean, here, here's a baby that was thrown out in the river in a dead gum basket, in a crocodile-infested basket. I mean, that's nuts. Raised in a pagan, yeah, a wealthy home, in a pagan culture, of all things, and then becomes a convicted criminal. Not just any crime, but murder. <laughs> and again, do you remember what we started out talking about? God specializes in taking what? Ordinary people and doing extraordinary things with them. And our limitations as we bring them to them. Hey, it's not prohibition to help. It's a platform that God says, look, look at what I did through Mo's life, through old Moses. S -s -s Stutterer, abandoned, criminal. I mean, you keep heaping all the reasons that he couldn't be successful. And here is a true man of faith. And it's not something you are taught. They didn't teach him about Jehovah God in Pharaoh's house. It's something that he caught. 
It's something that happens in your life. You say, Pastor, talk to me more about that. I want you to jot down somewhere these two P words. They'll help you understand about catching faith. The first P word is people. We catch on to faith through people around us. You ought to have a number of people in your life that are people of strong faith. You ought to work them to death to spend time with you. Every minute you can get with somebody that's faith-filled, hey, maybe some of that will rub off on you. But you got to understand, a faith walk happens inside of you. It's caught. It's developed. It's not a concept that you can teach someone to do that. Oh, I can teach you about stewardship, but something has to go off inside of you. I can teach you about the desire of God's word, but something has to go off inside of you. And one of the things that helps is when you and I are around godly students, godly young men and women, godly senior adults, godly people, great in the faith. When we're around those kind of people, great things begin to happen. They model for us. They inspire us. Not just their physical stories, but their stories written in text. George Mueller, a guy that died a hundred years before I was ever born, changed my life because here's a guy that put almost his whole life in, in, in orphanage ministry to the point that he had all these orphans and no money to feed them. And he came right down to the last morsel and he says, God, I don't know, I've got these 48 kids here and this is the last stinking meal. And there was a knock at the door. And that knock changed the whole format of the future going forward for George Mueller and those 48 kids. The other P word I want you to write down is places. You catch a walk in faith, not by just the people around you, but the places you go. In our first service, there was a... Uh, I, I better not tell you how old she is. She's not ancient, but she's pretty old. Over on my left, a lady in a blue sweater by the name of Janice Baldwin. And I, I was sharing with the believers in the first service, I was saying, hey, um, I will never forget two and a half years ago at our big uh, event when we were raising money at our chili cook-off for Malawi, the tears of two individuals that stood up there, Janice was one of those, Here's a lady that for some reason God laid on her heart at her age to go to Malawi. That's not an easy trip. To fly across the world to work with, with all kinds of people with challenging issues. To go in prisons in Africa of all things. And when she came back, God had transformed her heart. And as she stood up before our church showing the cesspool that they had been drinking out of and saying, hey, it's so little for us. I remember her standing up and big tears falling down her cheeks. It's like, it's so little for us to give $5, but it means the whole world to them. It was like, man, as I stood and watched her, I, 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 I'll just never forget it. Because God sent her to a place and he did something in her life she caught something there. She had heard pastors preach for 55 or 60 years about being faithful. But that place changed everything for her. A while ago when I was saying, she stood up and said, and I'm going again. And so I know Pastor Kevin's excited about that. Amen, amen. Jot down a fourth thing. Have you got those first three? They're important Starts with the Bible. Give God your first and best. Caught, not taught. And number four, sanctified dreaming. Now stay with me. Sanctified dreaming. And by that, I'm saying, it's interesting, these guys asked God for some special things that were close to their hearts. One of the things that was so important to Abel is, hey, hey God, I want to be your servant I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to return anything to you. It's all yours to begin with. But as we go down that list, others had different strengths and different application. And it brings us back to something that the psalmist wrote in Psalm 37, 4. When he said, take delight in the Lord. Do you remember these words? And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now that doesn't mean he's going to give you a Ferrari. 
Doesn't mean he's going to give you a $400,000 uh, cool custom ride that's an antique. What it means is, within the confines of his will, when there's something that really stimulates or motivates that you really love, and you ask God for it, God loves those moments when he can allow those things to come forward and come to truth and come to fruition in your lives. Another way of putting it is, you and I always gravitate toward our desires. I shared with our worshipers in the first hour about my wife, Becky Cook. Wherever I take Becky, if we go to Branson, Missouri, it doesn't matter. If we go to a restaurant and there's a piano in there and someone's playing, Becky Cook will migrate to that piano. She loves the piano. She loves to hear people play the piano. She loves to play the piano, keyboard, whatever it is. That is just always going to be a part of who she is. And I'm telling you, she loves those kind of moments, whether it be concerts or whether it be people just, she loves teaching people to play uh, the keyboard and the piano. That's a passion of hers. And you know, you and I are always, listen to me, we're always going to migrate right toward the very desires that we have in our life. Now, I just wonder, how long has it been since you've asked God and you've dreamed to God, God, if my marriage would only look like this. God, I'm asking you, would you bring about this in our church congregation, in our church life? I wonder how long this has been since a student has said, Lord, I dream about our student ministry looking like this and functioning like this and being like this. God, I'm just going to keep asking you for it over and over and over within the confines. Therefore, the sanctified, the dreaming part, that's so very important. And again, what is God, what is God specializing in? He specializes taking ordinary students, ordinary adults, and doing extraordinary things. <laughs> Boy, I better be careful here because they're sending this signal out. Let me think how to say this, but it needs to be said. Um... Boy, Becky, I hope I say this right. Uh, and she'll tell me at lunch if I didn't. I struggle with energy in our first service. Okay? Um, I can dance. I can do all kinds of things for them. And they just kind of sit there. And so motivating them to be responsible. You're responsive. I mean, at least you look at your watch, kind of like, hey, it's time to go. You know what I'm saying? The students are talking, they're playing Pac-Man, they've tuned me out. I mean, at least you're doing something to let me know, these people ain't listening to me, you know what I'm saying? Hey, it's time to go, we're hungry, I, I, I got it. But in the first service, most of the time, no emotion. And so today, we had a little hand-lifting Q&A session. I asked them when I got to this point, didn't have it in my notes, just kind of a spontaneous thing, and that's when it gets dangerous. I said, how many of you have ever said this? And I said, before I ask, you better be honest with me and fess up. How many of you have ever said, well, God still got me here. I'm still alive, so he must have a reason. And about half of the people were truthful. They raised their hand because almost every one of those older adults in that service have probably thought that and said that at some point in their life. And about half of them raised their hand, but I thought, praise the Lord, a response. Half the people raised their hand about this high, okay? That was exciting for me. It's about as much response as I've gotten in there. And I stopped and I just asked them the question. Have you ever asked God what the reason is? How many of you, what, a hundred of you raised your hands? About half of you in here? And not one single person could say they'd ever asked God at age 92, you still have me here. I sense God, I'm here for a reason. What? is the reason. Do you think he would show you? 
can answer you if you ask him, point you in a direction through a set of circumstances, through the power of prayer and his word. But we don't even ask. So number four, this concept is very important to grow your faith. I want to challenge you in this. This is important. You need to dream. You need to ask God for certain things. Number five, earnestly seek him. Earnestly seek him. When you go back to chapter 11, verse 6, you remember this is straight from the text. You remember it? God's word says, and faith, and without faith, what? It's impossible to please God. Remember Hebrews eleven six, 6? Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists. And the rewards will be those that what? Earnestly seek him. Write this phrase down out beside that. Track your walk. Track your walk with God. When you journal, when you do devotional life, track what's happening with you and God. Becky and I, we don't parent the same. We're not the same in so many things. But you know, one of the things is I'm fine with talking to my 30-year-old daughter every, once every couple of weeks. Not her mama. It's important for her mama to talk to her every day. And she could three or four times a day. And I'm always telling Becky, give them some space. How do you feel about your mother-in-law calling over here, your mom calling over here all, all the time? And they don't do that. But how do you feel about that? She says, well, we're 60 years old. I'm saying, look, give them some space. And of course, she comes back and says, well, she calls me as much as I call her, you know? I mean, it's that kind of thing going on. But one thing you can say about us is between the two of us, we love Amber Cook Walker. We love Randy Walker. We love their two foreign exchange students. One of them, Sophie, from the Ukraine. That her mother, grandmother, and grandfather have evacuated. Her dad stays there with a rifle on their farm, waiting to fight those that come to him. We love the four of them. And you can bet if you ask Becky Cook for sure, hey, what's going on in Amber's life? Buddy, she's going to know. Why? She loves her. She tracks what's happening with her. These students, do you think, hey, they're passionate about their grade? Well, these students may not care about their grades, but a lot of students do. No, our, our, we have great students. But uh, understand, we track that. Here's your grades every six weeks, every nine. Here's, here's semester grades. Here's end of the year grades. Here's exam grades. Here's how you're doing. Here's your class rank. Here, I, mean, I mean, we track it all. We track our families. Why? Because we care about that. We care about them. And I ask you, how many of you have ever spent any time tracking your walk with God? I'm telling you, you track things that you love and care about. Some of you have a vehicle that you love and you, you've written down every time you change the oil and, 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 and you listen for the slightest miss. You, you listen for the slightest squeal of the brakes. I mean, you listen for the tick of that turn indicator, better known in East Texas as a blinker. I mean, I mean you listen to that. Hey, I, I may have a bulb out. Hey, I'm, I may have a shimmy. My front end, you know how that vehicle feels. You track it. You care about it. And I would suggest to you that when we earnestly seek him that's what it is talking about track it number six listen for a call from God listen for a call from God just about every one of these guys that had and gals that had incredible faith had some kind of moment where God spoke to them audibly prayerfully or even through God's direction through a sense of circumstances. Can you, I mean, can, can, can you imagine that with Moses? Abandoned, pagan household going up, criminal record now for murder, and out of a bush, God says, Moses, Moses, hey, get your shoes off, dude. <laughs> this ground you're standing on, it's holy ground. And I've got something for you to do. Abram, Abram, you're leaving this big old plantation you've built up, dude. 
and you're going to a new land. Jonah, Jonah, you're going to a faraway land to be my mouthpiece, my messenger. Remember Jonah says, no, 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 I'm not going to Nineveh. I ain't having no part of it. God says, that's fine. I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Fishy Fishy for a while. And I just wonder, how do we ever get there in catching this faith without ever hearing a call from God? Some of us are scared when God calls. Miss Janice, you're going to Africa. Going where? Don't even have a passport. Oh, you're going to Africa. I just want to encourage you. Faith grows when we hear that. I ask our students today, what are you here for? Well, I'm here because my parents are going to whip the fire at me if I don't come. I got that. But what's your niche? What's your mission? What's your role? What call have you received from God at this point in your life? What are some of you young adults? What, what's, what's your role here? An observer? A distant worshiper? What exactly is God calling you to do? What's your place? How do you get that fulfilled? We've got to move on. Our time's gone. Number seven, last one. Just jot this down. No risk, no faith. The last thing to understand about growing your faith is that if there's typically not a dependence on God, and that usually translates to the word risk, not the board game risk, but to risk in your life. Risk brings us to those places where we enter into a place where we don't have control. It's in those places that God does his greatest preparatory work. It's in those places that God accomplishes his greatest things. It's in those places that God transforms us so we can be transformers of those around us. You remember when we started out, I said the difference in people that have strong faith, they've acted on the belief system. The difference is you move out of the religious doing the Bible Belt thing and you move into the area where you now are instruments that you start shaping, molding, and transforming the lives around you. That's why we pray for just every year a few student leaders that, have ex that exhibit incredible faith. We pray for some young couples that God brings to that place internally that they become people of faith. The last thing I heard when I walked out of the house this morning was a news network that was on our televisions throughout our little barn. And they said this just in to the desk. The leader of Russia has now proclaimed a heightened alert for the usage of nuclear weapons. And I thought as I got in my truck and made the journey over, man, do we live in some mixed up, freaking crazy times. We live in some days, don't we? That God describes as the last days. In the last days, perilous times will come. Remember that in your New Testament? People will be lovers of self. Boastful, arrogant, revilers. And the list goes on and on. But even in the midst of that, God is doing a work in a few. And that group, they're transformers, they're molders. They shape, and the aroma when they leave is a sweet aroma because things are so much better than before they ever came into our lives. Where would you be today without a mammal, a nana, 
a peepaw, a mom, a dad, a coworker, a friend that took time and faith, that was willing to not shrink back to say, our God is a great God. Have faith. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these moments we've had in your word today. We love you. We're so thankful for you and the power that you exhibit in our lives. Father, you take now the preaching and proclamation of your word. I I pray that I have taught it accurately just as you've asked me to do so. Father, for those that were a witness to your word, those that actually listened, those that jotted down these important principles, we trust now the power of your Holy Spirit to take it and to do a great work in their lives. Father, if you'll remember at the very beginning of this message, I made this statement. I said, my prayer is that you'll take what you placed in our heads now and move it to our hearts. And Father, that is my prayer, that you will allow someone, just as we were able to witness out of your text, a young man by the name of Abel that said, my God is worthy of much more than I could ever give, but he will get my first and he will get my best. Or whether it be Abram that came to God in the midst of a crazy request in a place that he had tremendous wealth in a plantation homestead that he had sunk his entire life in that was willing to go into a wife that no doubt raised her eyebrows and to people around him that said, are you crazy? And that call on his life, he was willing to answer it in faith. Father, I pray a special prayer upon our students today. We pray in just a few weeks we'll be able to bring to them a prospective candidate to lead this student ministry. And Father, we've been praying during this time of transition for God's man and God's family to come lead this ministry. And Father, we continue to pray for those students that will stand against all the odds, stand against culture, stand against the peers, And be willing to look different. To be willing to walk down the hall when they say, well, (laughs) there's Miss Goody Two Shoes. There's the glorified, glamorous Christian. No need to take her out. She won't. She will not. And Father, as we begin reading those very important words today in Hebrews 10, 32, I just reflect upon those words. (laughs) Wow, they move me. There's times that you've been ridiculed and persecuted and there's other times that you have stood with those that have been. So Father, would you bring forth from this student ministry some great students that are faith bearers, armor bearers in the faith. Some that can shape and mold and transform through your power other lives of students. Father, I love you. My days may be growing few. Ministry years are shrinking for me. So, Father, each and every opportunity that you give me, I will bring my very best. Lord, we love you. And these things we humbly ask and pray. Amen.